Raphael, all of my friends who are physicists talk about multiple universes as though it's the most obvious thing in the world. Here I am, trained in brain science, thinking I know a lot about science, baffled by all these multiple universes. Why should I believe it? There are a number of reasons why we consider the possibility of a multiverse. Um, really, one reason is just uh, being open-minded. There's no particular uh, argument for why we should consider only the part of the universe that we see today uh, when we think about the universe as a whole. Um, the part of the universe that we see today is about uh, 13 billion light years old and correspondingly because light has a finite speed and has only had this much time to travel to us we see only uh, several billion light years out in distance. Um, but that doesn't mean that that is the whole universe. That distance is an accident of, of the current moment in history that we find ourselves in. Uh, and every day, strictly speaking, we see a little bit more. Uh, we see light that only the day before was still on its way to us and hadn't quite reached us yet. And so in that sense, every day the uh, visible universe is getting larger. Um, so clearly the universe is more than what we see at any given moment. Now, when people talk about the multiverse, what they mean is a stronger statement still than that. Um, usually what they mean is that if you thought about regions of the universe that are sufficiently far away, uh, sufficiently far outside that, that region that we can see today, that they uh, not only might bring us a, a few new uh, light particles when, you know, if, they, if, they, if, they, if, if, if they ever uh, became visible to us, um, but that they would be really very different in the way that the laws of physics look. That uh, perhaps there would be different forces acting there, there would be different particles, uh, different laws of nature, at least apparent laws of nature at uh, low energies. And I think a good comparison um, would be to consider the different laws of nature that uh, are valid in, say, water versus air. Okay, I, I can put a wall here, I can put air on one side, water on the other, and I can ask, what is the speed of sound mm. in these two environments? And, well, it's going to be different. Sound travels at different speeds in water and in air because they're made out of different kinds of molecules. Uh, what is the conductivity of electricity? Um, and so on. So there are all sorts of things which you could consider effective laws of nature in each of these particular environments, which actually differ if you go across the wall to the other side. But they're both based upon the same fundamental laws. Exactly. They're both based uh, on exactly the same fundamental laws. They're both ultimately made out of the same kind of particles and forces. And really the idea of the multiverse, at least the kind of multiverse that comes out of string theory, um, is the same idea just on a grander scale. Uh, string theory gives you just one uh, starting point, just one set of fundamental ingredients. But depending on how you put them together, uh, if you don't probe at the very highest energies and on the very shortest distance scales, the effective description that you're going to use is going to look very different depending on how those ingredients are put together. Just in the same way as you know, the, the molecules of air and the molecules of water are put together in different ways from the same uh, elementary particles. Now it'd be, okay, these elementary particles themselves are actually put together in some ways by, by combining ingredients of string theory, and in some other region of the universe, they might have ended up being put together in a different way. Okay, so that gives us the potential for multiple universes, but not the reality. Well, how, do, how do we differentiate between the potential and the reality? As a physicist, I have to care about um, actually explaining some data. Um, now there are two pieces of data that point towards uh, a multiverse. One is the fact that there is both gravity and quantum mechanics, uh, and we have very few ideas about how to combine them into a unified theory. I think by far the most promising approach uh, is string theory, and string theory has more than just the three spatial dimensions that we experience. That's not a contradiction to our experience because it just means that if string theory is right, that means that the other dimensions would have to be curled up so small that we wouldn't have seen them yet in our best accelerators, mm -hmm. in our best microscopes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's actually plenty of room for that to have, to have happened. Um, while you know, we see fairly short distances compared to our everyday uh, experience, uh, 
uh, the distances that we are able to probe so far in the lab are extremely large compared to the smallest distance that makes sense in physics. And so there's a lot of room for those um, uh, extra dimensions to actually exist. Um, now, when you take string theory from its nine spatial dimensions and curl up six of them until you're left with the three large ones that we see, there's actually a lot of choice you have about how you curl up these extra dimensions. And um, this is comparable to the notion that, you know, when you build a block of iron out of atoms, well, there's a lot of choice you have about how you put them together. Mm -hmm. Think of building blocks of iron in these extra dimensions. There are things in string theory called D-brains, and you can combine them in different ways to hold together and curl these extra dimensions in particular ways. But every way you do it, these extra dimensions have a slightly different shape. And that shape affects what kind of particles appear to be around to an observer like us who can probe them only at these relatively low energies, mm -hmm. uh, not high enough to really take apart these extra dimensions and see all the, the bits and pieces that they're made out of. Um, so how these extra dimensions are put together de determines what particles, what forces, and so on we see. It also determines the weight of empty space, and I'll come back to that in one second. Um, but Joe Polchinski and I did an estimate about 10 years ago of how many different ways there are to put together these, these uh, six dimensions and curl them up. And we came up with, with an astonishingly large number, uh, perhaps 10 to the 500 uh, different possibilities. So that's like a one with 500 zeros. <laughs> Um, so that's an enormous number until you think about how many different ways there are to make a block of iron out of atoms, <laughs> which is a much larger number still than that. Mm. So really, numbers like that shouldn't surprise us so terribly from that viewpoint. When you're building a, a block of iron, all the, uh, the, the atoms are the same, but here you're saying each of these 10 to the 500 different ways that I, I guess you have a geometric shapes and how you get the, the 10 to the 500 different, different shapes and different ways of things are being put together. Uh, are, are they fundamentally different or, are they, or, or in terms of their output? The analogy between the blocks of iron that we can build from atoms and the different ways that we can curl up six extra dimensions in string theory by putting in uh, various fundamental ingredients like D-brains, that analogy is actually incredibly close. In both cases, uh, what you're really doing is making use of many, many copies of the same ingredient. In the block of iron, that's an iron atom. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can put together these iron atoms into lots of different shapes. You can, if, I, if you give me a block of iron and I move one atom over to this side and place it on some other part of the surface, it's strictly speaking a different block of iron. Uh, but similarly, it won't have any different characteristics. Well, that's true. It, it, to, to make it have different characteristics, uh, I would have to start moving more atoms and I, I, I would have to uh, perhaps shape the surfaces in different ways. Um, but in, uh, in the case of, of string theory, uh, the differences in the characteristics are, are more dramatic when you ask about low energies. But the basic method of how you generate this mm. large multiplicity is the same. Um, you have these fundamental ingredients called deep brains, and you're just using those over and over in different ways. Um, roughly speaking, you can think of these extra dimensions like, like handles of a, of, of a teacup, except there are perhaps many different handles, and you can can think of wrapping various numbers of D-brains around various different handles. And if you have 500 handles and you get a choice of wrapping between 1 and 10 D-brains on each of them, there you have your 10 to the 500 possibilities. And what happens in that case is that each one of them will generate a different series of fundamental physics laws? Yes. That's, that's the claim? How do you go from the different geometries of your D-brains to the generation of different physical laws? The, uh, well, I, let me give you uh, one example for how we go from the different geometries of D-brains to different uh, effective physical laws. Uh, and that actually gets me to the second argument for why we should seriously consider uh, this landscape of string theory and the multiverse that it leads to. Um, consider just this one aspect of the physical laws that we observe at the low energies that we're at. Uh, there's there's something very fundamental that we can observe and have actually measured uh, about 13 years ago, uh, which is the weight of empty space, if you will. It's, uh, it has different names. Uh, some people call it the uh, cosmological constant. Some people call it vacuum energy. Cosmologists like to call it dark energy because that sounds much more mysterious. Um, but dark energy is almost certainly just the weight of empty space. It's a fundamental constant 
in our region of the universe, but it's not truly fundamental um, because if you put more or fewer D brains into the curled up six dimensions, I think it's intuitively clear that that is going to affect what okay. we think empty space weighs when we uh, when 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 we measure it in our universe. Now, why is this an why is the observed value of of the weight of empty space an argument for considering the multiverse? The observed value of the weight of empty space, the observed value of the cosmological constant, is actually extremely mysterious from a fundamental physics perspective. Uh, for decades, actually, people have known how to estimate this quantity, not to calculate it exactly, but, but we knew uh, what average contributions to the energy of empty space are like. They come from theories that are extremely well tested in the lab, such as the standard model of particle physics, you know, a triumph of science, extremely precise, predicts lots of experiments well. But if you use it to calculate the energy of empty space, it gives you lots of contributions which are of order one in some set of units called Planck units. Now, um, that's a problem because the value that we actually observe is 10 to the minus 123 in those units. It's zero and then 123, zero, um, and then a one. And that's uh, obviously a massive conflict between theory and experiment. Now, it's possible these, these various contributions that we can estimate from the standard model, they can cancel each other. But if your theory just throws out a couple of numbers that are all about one or minus one, <laughs> yeah. and then you add them together, <laughs> And then you get 0, 0.00000, and there are you know, 122 zeros, and then another one. That's ludicrous. That is ludicrous. That clearly requires an explanation. Now, one interesting fact is that if you have vacuum energy, it limits the size of the universe that can be accessed uh, simultaneously by any kind of matter. So if we look around ourselves uh, in, in a universe with... Uh, cosmological constant of a given size, the size of the universe that we see is inversely proportional to that. The larger the cosmological constant, the smaller the box that we live in. The smaller the region that is connected in the sense that particles can actually interact and talk to each other and, and complexity of some sort can emerge. If, you, if the cosmological constant was of order one, uh, as the theory naturally predicts, uh, there would only be a few bits of information in the universe it'd be a very uh, impoverished sort of place. And there certainly wouldn't be any observers in it, no matter what you think observers require. They surely are more complex than a few bits. Um, so if you have a multiverse with 10 to the hundreds of different possibilities for the weight of empty space, such as what comes out of string theory, that well, once in a while, it's just like if you throw 10 to the 500 darts <laughs> blindly at a dartboard, once in a while, one of them is going to land really close to zero just by pure luck, and I, I'm terrible at darts, but if I, you know, if I had that many chances, I, I, I'd hit the, the, the eye at some point. And, and that is, is going to be the case in, in this landscape of string theory. Some of these 10 to the 500 ways of making three-dimensional space are going to result in three-dimensional space having very little weight, just by accident. And observers who presumably are complex objects are going to be found in regions of the universe where the cosmological constant is very small so that there is room for complexity. And this gives experimental justification for multiple universes, which theoretically you had developed from string theory, but by this data gives you support for it. Yeah, so I would say that this is actually the first experimental vindication of string theory. Uh, the, the fact that it, you see, the theory was not designed uh, to explain the cosmological constant problem. And this was, this was a very old problem. It is, I think it's considered perhaps you know, the most serious problem that plagued uh, late 20th century physics. Um, and string theory was not invented even remotely with the idea in mind of solving this problem. A and you know, there, lots of attempts were made at, sol at solving this problem in, in theoretical frameworks that had a lot more freedom than string theory gives you. String theory is very rigid. You don't get to play with anything. And yet it turned out to have exactly the kind of ingredients uh, that allowed us to address this problem in a way that just hadn't been thought of before. And so what's the conclusion for multiple universes? I think we should take them very seriously. Uh, I, I don't think that by any means we have a kind of smoking gun where it's, it's, it, the deal is settled and it's definitely true. Uh, I think they are currently the only game in town when it comes to explaining the cosmological constant. 
and possibly quite a few other apparently very fine-tuned parameters. Uh, but there are lots of challenges ahead in understanding how to compute probability distributions for other parameters and test the theory further.